Um, so I'd like to welcome you all um, to our International Women's Day event on behalf of Bristol Law Society and the Women Lawyers Division in Bristol. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Coralie McIver. Um, I'm the chair of the Women Lawyers Division in Bristol and I'm also the Honorary Secretary for Bristol Law Society. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by Alice today. Um, and before I hand over to her, I will just want to run through a couple of housekeeping points. Um, so I'd like to first welcome everyone and remind everyone that we're doing an extra large event today. Um, and I'd like to thank David Gilroy of Conscious Solutions for hosting us today and enabling us to have so many of you join us. Um, so we are recording the session. Um, so if you don't want to be seen, do uh, turn your cameras off. Um, and obviously, because there's so many people on the call, please keep yourself on mute. Um, we will be running a Q&A session after Alice's initial talk. Um, thank you to everyone who has um, submitted their questions in advance. Um, I will be running through those, but if you do have any more questions during the session, please do put them in the chat function and direct them at the hosts. Um, so we will try to get through as many questions as possible um, but obviously if there are any that we we don't manage to get to um, we will try and answer those after the session um, so like i said i'm delighted to be joined by alice today um, alice has previously spoken at one of our crucial conversations panel events in person as i'm sure some of you will remember um, and i'm delighted to have her back again for international women's day um, she's here to share her personal experiences in stepping away from the legal industry's expectations of what a lawyer should be um, so i will now hand over to alice and we will get started so that we can uh, maximize the time we have with her um, thank you alice over to you. Take myself off mute, that's a good start. Um, thank you Coralie, right, I'm going to try and share my screen. Can you see that? Coralie, can you see that okay? Yes, I can. Thanks, yes. Alice. Okay, great. So, hi, everybody. Um, thank you for, for deciding to share your lunch break, um, listening to me, um, especially on International Women's Day. So, pretty big day for us all to, to be sort of thinking about these sorts of things. Um, so, as, I mean, Coralie's done a brief introduction, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alice Stevenson. Um, I am a tech lawyer, originally from Bristol, um, but actually actually living in Amsterdam now, moved here last July. Um, and I founded my own law firm, Stevenson Law, about three and a half years ago. So in those three and a half years, we've actually grown pretty fast. Um, it's all been organic growth. So it's, it's um, we're, well, we're about 22 people now. Um, and last year, we were named the Boutique Law Firm of the Year by the British Legal Awards, so we were pretty proud of that. And a lot of our growth has resulted from me building my personal brand and building a bit of a name for myself um, as a bit of a misfit in our industry, I suppose you could say. So what I'm going to talk about in the next 20 minutes or so is about what led me to break away from being what a typical lawyer looks like, and behaves like, um, and how in doing so I found a way of staying in the legal industry that works for me. So just... So... I think I'm the only lawyer on social media who has a visible sleeve of tattoos. I haven't actually found anybody else. But I know that I'm not the only lawyer that has tattoos. Um, and I get messages from fellow tattooed lawyers all the time. So I guess what that does is begs the question of why am I the only one that's not covering them up? And the answer to that is because I got fed up with pretending to be somebody that I'm not. Um, and it wasn't just covering up my tattoos that I'd had enough of. That's, that's an example and a pretty big example and one that I talk about quite a lot. Um, but there are other examples and I'll come on to those in a second. Um, 
Now, don't worry, I'm not going to sit here and try and persuade you all to go out and get yourselves tattooed after this. Um, but what I am hoping to do is to make you more aware of how you might be adapting your behaviours and hiding elements of yourself that you should actually be shouting about from the rooftops. So apart from my transition to covering and not covering my tattoos, there are two key moments that stand out for me that I'd like to share with you. So for years, I hid the fact that I was only 18 years old when I had my daughter. I didn't tell prospective or current employers. And if anybody asked me how old my daughter was, I'd always try and dodge the question so they basically couldn't figure it out. I convinced myself that if anybody knew, they would look down on me and think that I was a screw up. And it was only a couple of years ago, bearing in mind now that my daughter is 20, and it was only a couple of years ago that I started talking openly about it. And I was amazed by the response. I had so many people telling me how incredible it was that I've achieved everything I've achieved, despite having faced such an obstacle at a young age. And it made me realize that I had got it really, really wrong. So the fact that we encounter obstacles doesn't define who we are. What matters is how we deal with them. Whether we give up at the first sign of a challenge or if we find a way around it. I was determined to make a decent life for me and my daughter, despite the fact that I was told by those closest to me that I wasn't going to be able to do it. I started university when Lydia was only one and worked my way up from there. And at one point we were homeless. We had absolutely no money. And when I look back now, I, I don't really know how I managed it. And lots of people ask me, but I think at the time they didn't feel like there was any other option. And I had to just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And, and now I'm really proud that I've got a 20 year old daughter and I talk openly about my experience of being a teenage mum. And I really hope that in doing that, I can help to support and inspire others who are facing similar challenges. So this is my second example. So when I was about three years qualified, I was working um, in the Bristol office of a city law firm and I was asked not to tell clients that I was working in the Bristol office um, so they could charge me out at London rates. So I decided to hand my notice in and leave fairly quickly after that. And the main reason for that is that what they were asking me to do directly conflicted with one of my personal values. Um, and that value is integrity. And I wasn't prepared to compromise that for anyone. So I handed my notice in and I left the same day and I had no job to go to. And I pretty much decided at that point that my career in law was over. So it turned out that it wasn't the end of my legal career, but it was definitely the start of a legal career on my own terms. So what I want to talk about now is the facade of conformity. So numerous research studies have shown us that employees feel pressure to suppress their personal values and pretend to go along with the values of their company, their employer. And they worry about being passed over for promotion if they show how important, for example, being a parent is to them or they worry about being viewed as radical if they wear clothing that reflects their religion, 
or even just their sort of quirky sense of style. Say you want to have, you know, pink hair or a nose ring. Not that nose rings particularly quirky, but in our industry, it can be. They worry about speaking out against company directives that are inconsistent with their views on social justice or sustainability. And they worry about being misunderstood and outcast if they share personal experiences of inequity and workplace microaggression. So in these situations, we often perceive that it's safer to put up a facade of conformity. We silence our divergent perspectives. So we'll smile when there needs to be a smile, or we'll frown when there needs to be a frown, and we'll nod when there needs to be a nod. But ultimately, when we put up this facade, it creates a sense of dissonance. And that makes us experience higher symptoms of depression, stress, anxiety. We end up less engaged and less committed to our employer with more intentions to leave. And that's the irony in all of this. Because we're pretending to fit in, we eventually decide that we don't want to. So if we have a look first at what drives conformity, and it's quite simple really, we want to be loved and accepted and we all fear rejection. And we hate the thought of making ourselves look stupid. So certain situations and environments promote conformity. In companies where employees aren't invited to participate in decision-making, we tend to feel more pressured to create facades. We think to ourselves, if I can't even say where I think the, the printer should go, then I'm definitely not going to talk about what I did at the weekend because no one's going to relate to that. So company culture is a key driver of conformity. And individuals believe that if they conform to the written and unwritten expectations, it will increase their chances of being promoted and getting a pay rise and just generally succeeding in their career. Now, this recent post of mine talks about how the glamorization of certain behaviors within law firms causes lawyers to brag about pulling all-nighters as if it's a badge of honor. It's not saying that we shouldn't work hard or expect others to work hard, but it's saying that in rewarding behaviors that directly contribute to burnout and to poor mental health, we're creating pressure to display unhealthy behaviors. And this creates an unsustainable environment because not many people are going to enjoy doing what it takes to conform. And at some point, they're gonna look for a way out. And the fact that over 24,000 people liked this post shows just how many people relate to feeling like this. It's actually quite scary, really. So if we take a look at conformity versus authenticity. So the opposite of creating a facade is authenticity. It's the alignment between our internal sense of self and our outward behavior. And the research suggests that when we experience authenticity, when we feel that we're living out our personal values and our personal perspectives, we feel a greater sense of well-being. We have lower levels of depression, stress, and anxiety, and we just generally tend to be more satisfied with our life. Our relationships are more meaningful and we're more engaged and happier in our work. So it seems like a bit of a no-brainer really. So why is it so hard to do? So 
In order to take off the mask of conformity, you need to understand who you are and what drives you. And this might sound a bit silly at first, but you'd be surprised at how few people could actually answer these questions. So when we hear about people having an identity crisis, it's because they're not in tune with what makes them who they are, essentially what makes them human. So this requires some time for self-reflection, bringing what's in your unconscious awareness to your conscious awareness. So just ask yourself now, have you ever really thought about what your values and beliefs are? or considered how your past and present experiences and relationships are influencing you? If I asked you that question now, could you answer it like that? We're all so caught up in the day-to-day, -day, keeping clients happy, finding new clients, keeping our team happy, managing everything at home. We have to really force ourselves to take the time for self-reflection, but it's so important that we take this time for ourselves. And when you have figured out who you are, it's then time to act accordingly. So as human beings, we have the capacity to empathize, right? That shouldn't be, that shouldn't be new to you all. But this also means that we have the capacity to know how you feel and if you're acting in a way that appears at odds with your reading of, this, of a situation. And what it does is it sets off a small but significant emotional alarm. So like those zebras, apes or meerkats, human brains need to see some consistency in messaging to know how to respond to themselves. All mammalian brains are troubled by social ambiguity and any deviation from consistency amongst social cues and the immediate response leads to us thinking, this person's not being entirely straight with me. So if, we give a, if I give a really simple example, if you think of the statement, hey, it's good to see you, accompanied by the speaker's eyes gazing away, perhaps a forced smile, what, what does that really say? Well, what it says is that person's not being authentic. Now, most of the time, that's not a problem. There's a whole set of culturally, man culturally mandated white lies that we tell every day. So if, if I extend the example above, hi, how are you doing? Hey, yeah, it's great to see you. I'm great, thanks. It's a standard conversational device, isn't it? And let's face it, very few of us want to have to deal with what could be the real authentic answer to that question, because it would probably take like the first two hours of every day if we did that. So authenticity does have its limits, but there are situations in which your team, your employer, your client need to know that they can trust you. And what happens over time is that their em empath empathic, <laughs> empathic and emotional sense that you're not acting in a way that appears to reflect how you feel will build and they will slowly, and in many cases without really knowing why, they'll disengage from you. And this could result in losing a client or a team member or potentially conflict and hostility. So in building a team and a practice, it's really important that people perceive you as acting authentically. And as I mentioned earlier, it's one of the key reasons why I've managed to grow my business so quickly. Sorry, I should have put that slide on before. Right. So what does it look like in practice? So for me, it affects my behavior every day. 
I can point to the specific examples that I've given today, such as not cover covering up my tattoos, leaving a job, talking about my experience being a single mum, but it runs a lot deeper than that. I've built my law firm around my personal values, so I can live and work according to them 24 seven. Now that's obviously quite an extreme step to take, and I know lots of you aren't in that position. So it's important to recognize that even if you're not in the position that I am, you still have control over your environment that you can use to your advantage. And what I've put here on the slides are some examples of the actions that you can take to break away from conformity. And the key one for me is the last one. Remind yourself and others that you're human. As lawyers, and I know that most of you guys are lawyers, we're constantly battling against negative stereotypes, which means that for some people, they don't appreciate that we are in fact real people. So we need to remind them. Now, when you start doing that, it's going to piss some people off. People who don't agree with what you have to say, or they don't like the decision that you've made. And our desire to be loved and our fear for rejection can make this difficult to deal with. So I've got almost 50,000 followers now on LinkedIn and Instagram, and I've reached the point where I can't really say anything without somebody jumping in and saying something mean. So I've been told by a magic circle partner that I clearly couldn't cut it as a lawyer and that I've got no integrity. I've been told that I look like a man because I lift weights. And I've been told that I'd never be someone's lawyer because my tattoos are unprofessional. Now, all of these are obviously comments from people that I don't know. They make no difference to my life whatsoever, but they can still be difficult to read and hurt my feelings. And it's obviously a lot harder to deal with comments like this if they come from people that you know. So it takes time to build the mental resilience you need to deal with people not approving everything you do. And it's the main deterrent from stepping away from conformity and sharing yourself with the world. But for every nasty comment, for every person that doesn't agree with you or like what you're saying, there's hundreds of nice comments from people who want to hear what you have to say. And to quote Mark Zuckerberg, when you want to change things, you can't please everyone. And if you do please everyone, you aren't making enough progress. And that's something that I'm constantly reminding myself of. Oh, hang on, I've got a slide mess up here. So this is the right slide now. So I'm sure you've all heard the phrase, be a flamingo in a flock of pigeons. Or to put it another way, be a rebel in a team of clones. We all know how important diversity and inclusion is, but it's more than just the race, gender, ethnicity, our protected characteristics. It's also about diversity of thought and ideas. And this is commonly called cognitive diversity. And there's a really good book about it called Rebel Ideas by Matthew Syed that I definitely recommend that you read. Diversity of thought is really key to innovation and inclusion. We all have our own frames of reference and we risk falling back on these perspectives over and over again, unless we surround ourselves with people who think differently to us. They bring different insights, experiences and thinking styles into our perspectives. So I guess we probably don't really want to be a flamingo in a flock of pigeons. And for those of you that know me and, and my company, you know that I'm a massive flamingo fan, but we really want to be a flamingo in a flock of lots of different types of birds. 
So sorry, I'm going to have to try and find the right slide now. I don't know what's happened here. I think I'm losing my mind. Trying to stay inside the lines. It's like you're wanting to play. So I expect some of you have seen that video before. Um, but what I wanted to do finally is to share how powerful sharing your story can be, both for you personally and for those around you. So for me, it was a gradual process of opening up, first of all, to the people that I was closest to, and then gradually building my confidence to share my story with the world more widely. And I initially thought that no one was going to be interested in my story because there's nothing particularly interesting about me. But it's not actually true. People are genuinely interested to hear about other people's stories. And this would especially be the case for student and junior lawyers who are sharing, you know, the same journeys as you guys. So a few months ago, I shared the video that you just saw on social media and it just blew up. It's had over 12 million views and I was absolutely inundated with messages from people who said that I'd helped and inspired them. And it actually was pretty overwhelming for me, it made me feel a bit uncomfortable having so many people looking at me. And on reflection, I also would have done my hair and makeup if I'd known how many people were going to look at it because I literally just rolled out of bed in front of my phone and recorded it. But that's, that's a lesson learned for sure. But my point is this, your story is interesting because you're interesting. And through sharing your story, it will help you to build your own profile and you can help others at the same time. And whether you choose to share within a small group of people or to the whole world on social media, it doesn't really matter. But if you let people get to know the real you, I promise you it's so empowering, you will not look back. So I think that is the end of my talk. So if I try and stop sharing. Right. Thank you very much, Alice. You're That's welcome. up soon now. <laughs> that was really great and it was really interesting to hear. Thank you very much. Um, so now I'll just sort of uh, run through some of the questions that have been submitted in advance. But if anyone has any more questions, feel free to um, pop them in the chat now that we've heard Alice's talk. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a few questions that have um, come from people who are you know junior lawyers are looking for a training contract um and so one of the questions was do you have any tips for challenging these expectations especially as a junior lawyer or do you think it's necessary to be independent or senior enough to challenge them or to change firms to a supportive and progressive one in order to do so yeah i mean it's a really good question i think The answer, unfortunately, is it, it depends. Ultimately, you've got to find somewhere that you're happy to work. There's always going to be a degree of conformity when you're a junior lawyer working for another, working for a law firm, um, because you you know, you're going to have to conform to the requirements of your employer. What you need to try and do is to find an employer whose values are as closely aligned to your values as possible so that you don't have this you know divergent perspectives so that you can you you know you're as comfortable as you can be in that environment and that's not an easy thing to do it's certainly a lot easier said than done um you know and i for one as a junior lawyer worked for several different employers and obviously the challenge you've got is the more times you move jobs, the more, you know, the more you worry about that raising a question mark on your CV. And it's not like, you know, you can just hop around and work for everybody. So I guess it's really a case of, first of all, trying to identify what do you want from an employer? What do you need from an employer? 
doing your research, speaking to people who are working there, trying to find out as much information as possible before you take the jump and accept a job offer to go and work somewhere. Um, and there's no guarantee that it's going to be the right place for you. I've certainly, you know, gritted my teeth and done the time to get, you know, the CV right and to get my experience. And it's very hard, but I think if you can be strategic about it, then you're much more likely to be successful. Thanks, Alice. And what about if you, you've not quite got the training contract yet? So one of the questions is, as an aspiring lawyer trying to get a training contract, what advice do you have for being non-conforming, but also not alienating myself from being considered in a tough market? I mean, there are so many different ways that you can train and qualify now. Um, that I would say just keep keep a really open mind about your route to qualification and think about what's going to be the best route for you. You know, if you, you might not be the type of person that's going to be happy working in a magic circle firm, or you might not be the type of person that's going to be happy working in a high street firm. So you need to, it's the same point as I made before, you need to decide what you need and what you want. And you know, I, I think you should be yourself, you know, when you're, whenever you're going for a job interview, it's really important that you sell yourself, that you, you give your, your prospective employer a flavor of who you are. There's lots and lots of junior lawyers out there, student lawyers out there with the same CV. And the only thing that's going to set you apart from those people is you, your story, your personality. So, I don't think you should you should feel afraid to show your personality, let it come through. I think it's really, really important. And ultimately, if you're not successful in an interview, then it's, it wasn't the right place for you. Yeah, no, great. Thanks, Alice. And next question is, do you find you become more or less risk averse as you've gotten older and sort of progressed? I think my risk appetite has changed. I think, you know, we all have, we all have different risk appetites for different things. And I would never describe myself as more or less risk averse. Um, I think, you know, I've got obviously running my own business. I'm extremely risk averse when it comes to taking on any risks that might affect my business. Um, but I've also become a lot more confident in myself and I'm certainly less risk averse now when it comes to saying what I think, putting myself out there. You know, I'm not worried now about what people think of me. Um, so it really depends on the context which you're talking about. And I think, and I think it varies. Um, and one of the comments that came through um, in the pre-submitted questions was, and I'll read it in full. Um, so I think you're so brave and I love your LinkedIn posts. I found it difficult not to conform and felt like I was being punished when I didn't. Shouting, being told that it's not the right career for me, etc. How do you deal with this and how do you feel now that you are in charge of your own law firm? It's really, it's really difficult and I completely relate to how you're feeling because I've, you know, I've been there and I've felt that. Um, and it, you know, when I was a junior lawyer, I didn't have as many tattoos as I've got now. Um, but I remember sort of having one on my shoulder and wearing a top and sort of every so often, like you would see the edge of the tattoo um, under my top and, you know, I'd get funny comments about it and it was just stupid really um I you know I think I would say don't be too hard on yourself don't take this personally um the fact that you're aware of what's happening is a really positive thing and I think what you need to do like I said earlier is you need to be strategic about how are you going to carve out a career for you in the legal industry assuming that that's where you want your career to be that you're going to be happy in, whether that's working for a different company, whether that's working for yourself, 
Um, there are so many different options out there now. There's, you know, firms like mine, there's, there's law firms, unregulated law firms doing all sorts of exciting things. So there's a lot more options available now than there were when I was a junior lawyer. So I don't think that you, you know, you need to be miserable. I think have a plan, explore the market, see what options are available um, and find somewhere that you think that you're going to fit in and ultimately be able to, you know, be yourself. Thanks, Alice. And next question is, um, what is the most significant shift in workplace attitudes and behaviour that you have noticed during your career? And secondly, what is the main thing that you think still needs to change? Mm. That's a difficult one. I mean, I talk a lot about the diversity issues that we have in our profession. Um, I think that there's been a shift in the perspectives on diversity over the course of my career. It's talked about now. It was never really talked about when I was when I was a baby lawyer. Um, but now it's talked about and we've got clients who are demanding that their law firms have a, you know, a diverse group of lawyers working on their, on their matters. And it's a really topical and important issue. And I think that, you know, we have made progress in, in that area, but I don't think we've made anywhere near enough progress. I think the fact that some law firms need their clients to tell them that they have to do this is really quite disappointing because it shows that they don't recognize why this is a good thing. And I think if they're not recognizing why this is a good thing, then they're only ever going to do the bare minimum that they have to do to basically keep on the right side of their clients. Um, so I, I do think whilst we've made some progress, there's a lot, there's still a lot of work to do. And I think that our, you know, our young lawyers, our junior lawyers have got a really big part to play in that. Um, and I'd really, really hope that, you know, the next generation of lawyers coming through can really make a sort of big impact on, on that and sort of using, using their voice, I think, to be heard on why this is an important issue and why they're not going to work with companies that aren't going to take this seriously and deal with it properly. Yeah, that does touch across one of the other questions we've had, um, but I think you've answered it. Um, but I'll read it just in case you, you have anything to add. It says, um, do you think equality and diversity truly exists within law firms and gets by in at board level? Or is it just used as an external PR message to make the firm look good? I mean, ultimately, it depends on the law firm, right? We can't we can't generalize around about all law firms, um, but I don't think that enough law firms do take it seriously enough. You know, the fact that on average, only one third of law firm partners are women, it, you know, the numbers speak for themselves, right? So we're definitely, definitely not there yet. And then we have um, some uh, questions in terms about um, building your brand. So one of the questions is, what would be your top three tips in building your own brand? Mm. So I'm not a marketing expert. Um, and I'm sure a marketing expert would be able to answer this a lot better than me. For me, I mean, I've built a few brands. I've built my company brand. I've built my personal brand. Um, I love doing all, you know, the pretty stuff, like designing the logos and the colors and the pictures and, you know, all of that stuff is, is really fun. And I could do all of that all day. Um, but ultimately, I think what you need to think about when you're building a brand is who, who is your audience? Who are you talking to? Um, because if you don't know who you're talking to, then that's just going to be a complete waste of time. Um, what's your message? 
So what is it that you're trying to say to them? And, and how are you going to say it? So, you know, for me, it's a, co a combination of mostly social media, but then I've also got my website as well, which has some content on, but there's lots of different ways that you can deliver that message. So you need to, you need to decide what the right channel is for you. Thank you. Um, and then next question is, um, and I appreciate it's, it's quite wide, um, but it's where do you find your inspiration? Mm. It's quite wide. I mean, there's so many, there's so many inspiring people out there. It's, it's crazy, right? You've got a massive, massive long list of successful um, entrepreneurs and businesswomen. And I love reading um, books about them all and hearing about their journeys and their stories. Um, and I'm definitely inspired by those people because I think they really show you that, you know, just one person, just little old me, can actually achieve so much and can make a really big difference. But I think, you know, the person that really does inspire me the most is definitely my daughter. She's always been the reason why I work so flipping hard. Um, and, you know, the reason why I, I do what I do. And, you know, now she's 20, she's a really, she's a really, really strong, independent young woman. She's um, living in Plymouth, she's at university, she's always known what she wants to do. She's working with, on, you know, with animals, on conservation issues, and I'm just so proud of her. And I would never, ever want to do anything that, you know, would would make her see me differently, I suppose. So she's definitely my, my number one inspiration. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, and then I've had a question that's, that's come into the chat. Um, why do you think you've been able to identify this from such a young age and run with it since the start of your career? I'm not that young. <laughs> I'd love to think that I was really young. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not that young. Um, you know, the truth is that I'm 40 this year. Um, and actually, God, I think if I had cracked this, you know, in my 20s, God, just think what I would have achieved. Um, I wish that I had cracked this a lot younger. Um, it, you know, it does, it takes time. It takes time to, to get ex different experiences. It takes time to build your confidence. Um, and it, you know, it takes different people, different lengths of time, for sure. But, you know, the fact that all of you guys are here on this talk just shows that you've got a willingness to learn and to listen to other people. And that is the first step, right? Because if you don't have a growth mindset, if you've got a fixed mindset and you think that you know everything that there is to know, then you're never going to get there. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that leads us into the next question, which is what advice would you give to your younger self? So I think somebody's off mute. <laughs> oh, perfect. What advice would I give to my younger self? Yeah. It depends what age, what age we're talking about, really. Um, I did a, I did a TikTok last week, actually, which was what I would say to what I would say to my 18 year old self when I was pregnant. Um, and when I was pregnant, I, I mean, my family just turned their back on me. I didn't have any support. I was completely on my own. And, and I felt pretty hopeless at the time. But I knew that I had to, I had to figure this out. I had to make it happen. And I think the advice I would have given to myself would have been that you are capable of doing this. You can absolutely do this and you can make it work and you will make it work because self-belief is, is I think one of the most important things that there is really, because if you don't believe in yourself, if you don't believe that you're capable of doing something, then nobody else is going to believe in you. So that's got to be number one. That's got to come first. And we all have moments where we doubt ourselves. You know, I have imposter syndrome as much as the next person. I'm certainly not infallible, 
But ultimately, when those thoughts creep in, when I start to doubt myself, I recognize them and I deal with them. I tell them, you know, get out of my head. I don't want them there. And I think that that's really, really important because we, you know, we can be our own worst critic for sure. Yeah, well, we've had a, another question in the chat. Um, do you think the increased visibility of employees' home lives due to working from home following the pandemic presents an opportunity for increasing diversity and non-conformity in the legal profession? I hope so, definitely. I mean, I think it's, I do think that it's broken down some barriers. Um, you know, I, before the pandemic, I knew female lawyers who would work part time and they would take phone calls on their days off. Um, and they'd literally be like hiding in cupboards to take these phone calls because they didn't want their children to be heard on the call. So, you know, they'd be running around the house trying to escape their children whilst trying to speak to this client that they shouldn't even be speaking to because it was their day off. Um, because there was definitely used to, well, there definitely used to be a perception that if your children were visible on a work call, then that was not acceptable. And I, and I think that's changed. Although I don't have any real insight into what it's like in the big law firms during this period. But I think, I think that has changed. I think it's now a lot more acceptable. I've just heard my children come home now and thinking, oh God, one of them's just gonna wander in and say hello to you all. Um, but I think it's a lot more acceptable now for children to, you know, to Zoom bomb calls. Um, you know, one of my teams said that they were on a client call yesterday and, the client's four-year-old came in during the call and gave a little recital on their recorder and then left. Um, and these things are happening all of the time. And I think that that is, that is great. And I hope that that continues. I think whether or not it's going to increase diversity, I'm not sure if I see such a strong, such a strong parallel between that. Um, but I think hopefully people feel more like they can be themselves now there's certainly lots of sort of funny tiktok videos going around about people sort of you know doing zoom calls with their pajama trousers on and you know shoving a suit jacket over the top and um you know and ultimately you're a lot more comfortable in your own home hopefully it's the most comfortable place that you're going to be and therefore the, the place that you're going to most likely feel like yourself like you're not putting on any airs and graces yep no thanks alice and um what tips do you have for um setting boundaries and uh getting rid of that sort of busyness always on culture or feeling that um lawyers tend to find themselves uh, working towards i mean it's a difficult one um I think it's very difficult when you're a lawyer in particular and you've got expectations or ex there are expectations of you to always be on and you don't want to you don't want to let people down you know ultimately most of us are doing our job because we enjoy working with our clients we enjoy helping our clients and we don't want to let them down but it's not unreasonable for us to have have our our downtime have our rest time so i think i think it's about identifying what those boundaries are and communicating those boundaries with the people that need to know um and sticking to them as well because i think one of one of the riskiest things is you you know you set boundaries but then you don't keep to them yourself and then they're completely meaningless so find a way that you're going to be able to stick to them yourself. I think that's really, really important. And uh, we've had another question come in the chat. Um, do you think we are likely to see a shift away from big firms post COVID 
young people, entry level applicants coming through and seeing that there are different ways to get into the legal industry? Yeah, I mean, the big firms are always going to be, I guess, a primary source of um, jobs, right? You know, I, I would love to, I would love to have loads of trainees, but the size of my firm means, that, you know, I can't, I can't hire tens of trainees because we're just not that big. Whereas the bigger firms, they've got the resources to recruit trainees in larger numbers. So that's not going to change anytime soon. I think what is changing are the options out there. We've got the SQE coming in. So we've got more flexibility around where people can train. And we've also got so much going on in the legal startup space. So many new entrants to the market. The, you know, the SRA change, um, well, I guess, you know, the SRA change in regulations, we're an ABS now, which means that we've got a lot more flexibility to do things. So there's a lot more opportunities for people out there who don't want to go down the, you know, the conventional big law route. And I think that's great. But I think for the time being, there's always, there's going to be a place for, for the big firms and for big law. I can't see them dying a death right now anyway. They're going to be around for a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and then that leads me on to my next question. So if you could implement three things in every single law firm, what would they be and why? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Should have prepared for this one. Gosh, this is a hard one. Three things in every single law firm. So one of the things that we do at Stevenson Law, which I love, and I think every single law firm should do, is we have a highs and lows session at the end of every month. And we have uh, volunteers, and they're not forced, I promise you they are, but willing volunteers. And what they do is they talk about something good and something bad that's happened to them that month. So they share you know, a really positive experience, and then they share something that's not so positive. They've made a mistake or a client's been really cross with them or they haven't handled a client as well as they could have done. Um, and what that does is really helps promote a culture that it's OK to make mistakes. Like, and, I, and I share on this as much as everybody else. So we talk about the mistakes that we make. We talk about how we could have avoided that mistake. And in sharing our experiences, we're also learning from each other's mistakes. So I think I love that. And I think every firm should do that. I think every firm should have a policy that people can wear what they want. I'd love to see that. I'd love to see more lawyers with pink hair and, and tattoos everywhere. I think that would be really, that would be a really positive step. And then I need a third one. Um, I would like to see all law, all law firms encouraging creativity and innovation. So creating some kind of forum where everybody can put forward ideas and there aren't any bad ideas. I mean, obviously there will be some bad ideas, but you know, you don't label them as bad ideas. Um, where everybody can put forward their ideas and share ideas and it's all very collaborative. And, and on the back of that, action is actually taken to implement the, the best of those ideas so that we can finally see a bit more innovation in this industry and listening of the people that are you know really working their asses off to you know to do what they're doing yep. uh, thanks alice and uh, i think We've got time for one more question. So uh, <laughs> one last question. So um, what tips do you have for um, building mental resilience or pushback to trying to be yourself or make change? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the answer is it does take time. You're not going to develop mental resilience overnight. And it's not an easy thing to develop um, because you are going to get 
you're going to get that pushback. You're going to get that negativity. You're going to get that rejection, if you like. Um, and it's not going to make you feel good. But I think ultimately, like everything that we have to do, whether it's going to the gym, whether it's eating healthily, you know, we have to force ourselves to do these things because in the long run, it, you know, it's going to make us a stronger person. And I think if you recognize that in pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, eventually it will get easier. But if you push yourself outside of your comfort zone and then immediately think, oh God, I don't like it here. I'm going straight back into my comfort zone. Then nothing will change. You have to push yourself out out of your comfort zone you have to put yourself in these situations where you're going to develop mental resilience to actually develop as a person yeah no thank you Alice. A great answer so i think that's all we have time for today in terms of uh question and answering so i'd just like to say another thank you to alice for joining us today for our international women's day event and uh being so open and honest with uh, her experience and answering all of your questions um just another thank you um to conscious solutions for hosting the uh webinar today um and i'd just like you to remind you of our upcoming events so we've got um uh, BLS are hosting uh, stress in the legal profession event on the 24th of March um, and the next um, women lawyers division uh, event will be on uh, communication differences in communication between men and women which is coming up next month um, so if you're on the email list you'll get notifications of those events thank you very much everyone thanks everybody